Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, we welcome you to another broadcast of the Life for Two Institute, Life for All Institute. We come to message 26, the spiritual battle against the spiritual forces of evil. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 to 12. And in chapter 6, in Ephesians, first we must clarify that we're broadcasting from Rio de Janeiro. We're in a conference for all the churches in the state of Rio of Janeiro. We're with a very strong spirit. We went out to preach the gospel yesterday, uh, the producing overcomers. Many people were saved and won for the Lord uh, through the written word. And now on uh, Sunday morning, we're finishing the second message, which is message 26 of the prophetic word, which is the spiritual battle. Chapter 6, verse 10 of Ephesians says, Finally, be empowered in the Lord in the might of his strength. Finally, when Paul says this, it means that after he had written about all the blessings that God had given us through the river of grace, by the dispensing of the channel of grace, which brought us growth in life, it brought us maturity in life, it brought us the building up of the church as the body of Christ, that grace also came to bring reality to our life. Our life was full of vanity, starting with our mind. Our mind only housed lies, vanity, and great emptiness. But when we believed in the Lord Jesus, the river of grace passing through us as channels of grace, we were being filled or with the very truth. In this universe, there's only one truth. That truth is God. That truth is Christ. The postmodern world tries to convince man that truth is not absolute, that truth is relative. Relativism has taken control of our present society. There's no unique truth. I have a truth, you have a truth. This distorts everything that God wants to do in this universe. Before God created the universe, only he existed. Therefore, truth is God himself. If we take God out of this universe, there would be nothing left. God is the very truth. God is reality. When you say that, that truth is relative, that is a lie. Because God himself is truth and God himself is reality. When man separated from God in the Garden of Eden, he separated himself from the truth, from reality. When you... Eliminate God as truth and reality. What is left is emptiness, 
and vanity. One day we believed in the Lord Jesus. We received the life of God, his holy nature, and we began to receive the spinsing of his grace from the river that flowed out of the Garden of Eden. By the grace we grew and we built up and our life began to be filled with the very truth. Christ said he was the way, the truth, and the life. Our life gained meaning and it began to be consistent. Not just a facade full of vanity. We began to love God and to love man. God who is life illuminated our life. We didn't live anymore in darkness and in sin. Where every sin, we have the sensitive, sensitivity because we're in light. Thank the Lord we're each day being uh, wrought more of God's life into us. We're walking in grace and truth, love and life, and this light, and this is to walk in the Spirit. Now, God's Word gives us direction. And we began to speak the Word of God amongst ourselves and to practice immersion in the Word. And this Word is being constituted in us and is doing the work of God in us. This is wonderful. This Word is changing our very marriage. This Word is changing our family. It's changing our way that we relate with people at work. Our whole human life is being normalized by the Word. Now, it says finally, the church on the positive side is advancing in this way of grace. But we also need to know there's still something that we need to pay attention to. Finally, finally, we have a spiritual warfare. I'm going to read again a, a, a summary that I made here. Grace, which is described all that the river of grace has done in our life. It reminds us that we're in a spiritual warfare. Grace saved us and made us channels to dispense this grace to other people. D dispensing this grace to other people through the preaching of the gospel, taking care of them, we grow and mature and the church is built up. As a result, we're being filled with Christ, filled with Christ, as the truth and the very reality. With more experiences of grace, deeper experiences, we find God as love. Our life becomes a life of giving and, and giving ourselves to others, for, to God and to our neighbor. This is an offering and a sacrifice to God and a sweet smelling fragrance. We come to live to re the reality of life in our daily life. We also begin to live in light, sensitive to sin and the work of darkness. Through light, we maintain a good, humble heart, pure, and with a good con conscience. With the supply of Grace, truth, love, and light. Through the Spirit, we incorporate all the spirituality in our 
human life and our marriage life, our family life, and our work life. We close off all the gaps to the enemy, and now we're ready for the spiritual battle. Now I'm going to speak about our battle, our warfare. There is a battle. The Bible shows us that Satan has a kingdom. In Matthew, in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 12, in verse 26, the Jews accuse the Lord of casting out demons by the chief of demons, which is Belzebub. So the Lord responds to them, answers. If Satan casts out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? The important thing of this verse is, is that the Lord Jesus recognizes that there is the kingdom of Satan, another kingdom, the kingdom of Satan. The same matter is in Luke chapter 11, verse 18. If Satan also is divided against himself, how shall his kingdom stand? For you say, that is by Beelzebub that I cast out the demons. So here it's clear. Descri- clearly describe that Satan has his own kingdom. How did that come up? What was the origin of that? To go back to Isaiah 14. Before creation, only God existed. We're not talking about the universe of time and space. It's eternity. Only God was in eternity. Then God created things, the heavens and the earth. All of creation was under his government. Under his kingdom. But something happened. That caused another kingdom to come up. This is what we need to see. So we can see the reason of our spiritual warfare. Chapter 14 of Isaiah. Verse 12. How have you fallen from heaven. O day star, son of the dawn, how you have been hewn down to earth and you've made nations fall prostrate. Here shows a being that has the name of the day star. This word, day star, in Vulgar Latin is Lucifer, the day star. So we take this word, this term, to call him Lucifer. Who was Lucifer? He was the son of the dawn. What does that mean to be the son of the dawn? It means that he was one of the first to be created amongst the the angelic beings. 
And this is why he was called the Son of the Dawn. He was established by God to be the head over the rest of the angels. This is why he was called the Son of the Dawn. We can see that in Ezekiel 28. Ezekiel chapter 28. Verse 14. You were the anointed cherub who covered the ark. Indeed, I set you so that you were upon the holy mountain of God and you walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Lucifer had a high position. He had a position of leadership. He had the privilege of being in the holy mountain of God, which is the third heavens, where God dwelt. He was an anointed cherub that was so close to God, and he kept God's glory. And his position was so high. If we look at the book of Jude, which is after the third book of John, Jude, verse 9. I'm going to look at verse 8 first for context. Nevertheless, in like manners, these dreamers also defiled the flesh and despised leadership and reviled dignities. This means that there are some who despise leadership and revile all authorities. But verse 9, Miguel the archangel, when he contended with the devil and disputed, Concerning the body of Moses, did not dare to bring a reviling judgment against him, but said, The Lord rebuke you. By this verse, you can understand that the archangel Michael had a position inferior to that of Lucifer. He didn't dare to speak judgment against the devil, against Lucifer. He just said that the Lord rebuke you. This means that Lucifer had a very high position he had headship and leadership over the rest of the angels when he was created. In Isaiah 14, when it began to speak about Lucifer in verse 12, This word is actually against the king of Babylon, which is Nebuchadnezzar. So Lucifer is spoken of here as being identified uh, with someone related to Nebuchadnezzar. This we see in Verse 4. So you will lift up this discourse concerning the king of Babylon, and you will say, How the oppressor was ceased, how the raging has ceased. So the Lord is using this to speak against the end of Satan's tyranny. And Jehovah 
has broken the staff of the wicked and the rod of rulers, and that he struck the people with wrath and with strikes that would not stop, that ruled the nations with anger and with, with pursuit that would not let up. And all the earth rests and is undisturbed, and they break forth in ringing shout. When we preach the gospel, we are taking out people from the tyranny of Satan. We're going to take people from out of the persecution of Satan. This is our battle. In Isaiah 14, verse 12. How have you fallen from heaven, O day star, son of the dawn? How have you been hewn down to earth, you who made nations fall prostrate? But you, you said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven above the stars of God, and I will exalt my throne, and I will sit upon the mount of assembly. These stars refer to the angels of God, and, and I will sit upon the mountain of assembly. This is where God assembled the angels for an assembly. In the uttermost part of the north, this is where God was. I will send above the heights of the clouds, and I will make myself like the Most High. All the rebellion is promoted by the ambition for power. The ambition for power begins always with uh, the ability of a creature. We'll go back to Ezekiel. Ezekiel 28, verse 12. Son of man, Satan desired to be equal to God. He had the ambition that God would need him to govern creation. Because God is a crea creator. May not understand the creature. He could be the intermediary between God and man. His ambition of power made iniquity enter into his heart. This is where he sinned. All the rebellions in the, in the Bible are connected to the ambition for power. So, brothers, we will take care and care for our heart. Especially if you get a place of... Uh, of honor and you think that you are capable and you think yourself to be very good you're only a step away from falling a step away from rebellion for example for example in numbers chapter 12 do you remember this story i have many verses but i'll only mention a few Chapter 12, verse 1. And Miriam and Aaron spoke 
against Moses because of the Cushite woman whom he had married, for he had married a Cushite woman. Apparently, it seems that this was not something that Moses had done properly, taking a Cushite woman. But this came to be a pretext because of an insatisfaction of Miriam and Aaron. In verse 2, they use this as a pretext. But the words that they spoke show that they were had insatisfaction in terms of position. And they said, Has Jehovah indeed spoken only through Moses? Has he not also spoken through us? And Jehovah heard it. Brothers, God chooses men as channels to speak for him on the earth. And Moses was chosen in that, ep in that time. And God raised him up to take the people to the good land of Canaan. Some want to spiritualize things too much, but God uses men. But God uses a proper man without ambition who has been worked on in terms of ambition. But the others need to recognize that that man speaks for God. So those who are close to him, those who are leaders, would dispute uh, leadership with him. So why would God only speak through him? So verse 6, God said, he said, Hear now my words. If there is a prophet among you, I, Jehovah, will make myself known to him in a vision. And I will speak with him in a dream. This is another kind of prophet. My servant Moses is not so. He is faithful in all my house. I will speak face to face, even openly, not in riddles. He beholds the form of Jehovah. Moses was so close to the Lord, he could see his form. Why then did you not, were you not afraid to speak against my servant? against Moses. All the rebellions in the Bible occur in the same way. You don't accept that God speaks through that person, so you want to dispute authority and power with that person, uh, to have a, a position uh, uh, of recognition. Satan, Satan, uh, brought in this uh, dispute for recognition, which brings in other desires. We're not going to fall. We should not fall into this trap. He, Satan wanted to exalt himself to be equal to God. His heart was lifted up. He became proud because of his extraordinary beauty, as is said in King James, uh, Acts Rod's version in Portuguese. Now, because of this, he became the ad, uh, adversary of God. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. Be sober. Watch your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion walks about seeking someone to devour. Are you conscious that we're in the middle of a spiritual warfare? 
the devil. L Lucifer became the devil and Satan, the adversary of God. He walks around as a lion roaring to look for his prey. He's looking for someone to devour. Revelation 12, verse 9. And the great dragon was cast down. The ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole inhabited earth. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast down with him. In King James, actualized version in Portuguese says, he, he's the one who has the capability of deceiving the entire world. So our adversary is very, very powerful. He's, he's capable of seducing and deceiving the entire world. Chapter 12 of Revelations. Excuse me, chapter 20 of Revelations, verse 2. And he laid hold of the dragon, the ancient serpent, who is the devil and Satan, and he bound him for a thousand years. Now it's Satan, the devil, the ancient serpent, the dragon. This is our adversary. What is he doing with this world? We should go back to Genesis. Genesis chapter 11. Genesis chapter 11. Verse 4. And they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens. And let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered over the surface of the whole earth. This is talking about the Tower of Babel. This is a declaration of man, of a kingdom formed by Nimrod. It's a declaration that man does not want to be connected anymore with God doesn't want to exalt any more God's name but his own name, man's own name. This was the result of the rising up of a man called Nimrod. Verse 8, chapter 10. This is chapter 10, verse 8. It says, and Cush begat Nimrod, and he became a mighty one on the earth. And he was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Therefore, it is said, like Nimrod, a mighty hunter before the Lord. And he began his kingdom in Babel, and Erech, and Akak, and Kelna, and the land of Sinai. And from that land he went into Assyria and built Nineveh and Rehobothir and Kela. You can see here why Isaiah 14 says that Satan was identified with the king of Babylon because Nimrod established the first kingdom in the earth in Babel, which is Babylon. 
Why is Babylon against the kingdom of God? Because in Babel, uh, he established his human kingdom, his human government. If you look at the time period of Nimrod, about 150 years before, God had exterminated the kingdom of men, the race of men in the, in the flood. But he had saved by Noah's family. So when Noah and his family came out of the ark, there was a uh, corpse over the entire earth. Could you see the sense of tragedy that Noah and his descendants experienced? There, a fear, a uh, uh, a fear to God, uh, about God was brought up, but it wasn't a holy fear. It was a fear that God would punish man with such a cruel way. So Nimrod said to this people who lived under this uh, kind of fear that God would punish man if they made a mistake and there would be a new tragedy. So Nimrod said, we're going to terminate God's tyranny. We won't have any fear of God. We can live by ourselves. We'll be independent from God. We can take care of ourselves. We'll be independent from God. This is how the first human government began. And man needs three things to, to survive. He needs... Sustenance, he needs joy, entertainment. He needs uh, protection. So Nimrod invented cities. And he put people in those cities. He created a system that everyone could be able to survive by having their uh, sustenance. And they would be kept within that uh, walled city so that they would be protected against any enemy. And he created all kind of entertainment, music, dance. And so he made it to be understand man could take care of man. So man began to declare independence from God and he created a tower to reach heaven, to say God, to God, I don't have any, I'm not afraid of you. If you, if you send another uh, flood, I'll be way up in the heavens. That's how human government was raised up. And he governs man by desire of power and ambition for power because who has power has money. And who has money has privileges. So he continues to govern the earth this way. Oh, Lord Jesus. I want you to see clearly who is our enemy and who we're fighting against. Psalms chapter... Two, verse one. And why do nations? Why are the nations in an uproar? Why do the people contemplate a vain thing? And the king of the earth take their stand, and their rulers sit in council together against Jehovah and against His anointed. Let us break apart their bands and cast their ropes away from us. Satan influenced the nations, the leadership, the princes, the governors, 
of the nations. You need to see that our modern world, uh, as we're, as the world in these last times are being taken to this. Satan's objective is to cause man to desire to be fully separated and free from God. Nimrod began to establish human government and to establish cities in ba Babel cities and which became Babylon and then he went to Assyria, Assyria and he founded many cities starting with Nineveh. These became the places where where the kingdom of Israel and Judah were taken captive. Israel was taken captive to Assyria and Judah to Babylon. These two places. And even today, Satan wants to take God's people captive to these places. The Lord raised up the kingdom of the nation of Israel. From Babylon, all the people and the nations of the earth became pagan and uh, full of idolatry. God raised up Israel to be his kingdom on the earth, but unfortunately that kingdom was also taken captive to Assyria and to Babylon. But God wants to restore that nation uh, in the end of times. But God wants to do it today in the church. When God brought in Christ and brought in uh, Christianity, Many things were changed on the earth. The God's laws in Israel influenced the world. And then Christianity influenced the world. Then the, the uh, human behavior was influenced by Christianity and by Judaism. But the tendency of the world is to break all ties with God. Human government today, leader led by Satan, is to break away from all influence uh, from God and the Word of God. Man doesn't want, doesn't want God's Word, doesn't want God. They want to disconnect themselves from God and His anointed. But we are going the exact opposite direction. We want to introduce God's kingdom through the word of God. To bring in God and Christ, his leadership. So the kings of the earth uh, are rebelling to break all ties with God. But it, God who sits in the heaven is laughing at them in his anger. Verse 5. Then he will speak to them in his anger, and in his burning wrath he will terrify them. Verse 7. Shows that God did not choose Lucifer to be his intermediary. That before, in his eternal purpose, before the foundation of time, God had already established that Christ would be his chosen one. Verse 6 says, And I have installed my king upon Zion, my holy mountain. Christ is the chosen one. Christ became a man. And 
if Satan thought that God needed a creature to understand man, God, Christ became a man, he understands man, he knows how to understand our weaknesses. Even more, when he chose that man, he anointed that man. And I will recount the decree of Jehovah. He said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten to you. He was the firstborn son born of God. God put him above all principalities and powers. Above sit by my right, right hand until I put all of your enemies under your feet. So God says to his son in verse 8, Ask of me, and I give the nations as your inheritance, and the limits of the earth as your possession. So he'll, he, he'll only have to ask, and God would give it to him. And I will break them with an iron rod. And you will shatter them like a potter's vessel. So God is fulfilling uh, the son's request. Psalms 110. Verse 1. Jehovah declares to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies as your footstool. This is because the son asked. And God said, the father said, I will answer your request. So how will God do this? God will send from Zion. Uh, the scepter of your strength from Zion rule in the midst of your enemy. Zion refers to the army of overcomers who fight for the kingdom. God has his church here on the earth. God, by the gospel, saved many people. He regenerated many people. But those many people are part of the city of Jerusalem. But still, there may be very few living here on the earth concerned with establishing God's kingdom and bringing his kingdom back to the earth. We're not happy with Satan's kingdom here on the, on the earth. We're not happy with the dominion of corruption and carrying man to misery and suffering. People are like sheep without a shepherd. They're exhausted. They're wounded. We're going to change that kingdom. Lord Jesus. The Lord today needs that his church, that part of his church, to be Zion. The church in Philadelphia, in Revelation 3, that church is concerned with the kingdom of God. Because who is in the church in Philadelphia? Who is there is the Lord who has the uh, keys of the kingdom of David. We're concerned with God's kingdom. We have little strength. We don't, but we don't leave off. We don't leave off his name and his word. In the year of uh, a thousand, in the 1800s, uh, 
a Christian historian said that Philadelphia would have the treasures of the prophetic word. We're fighting. We're fighting and we're winning this war, but not by our capability. We're not capable. We have little strength, but we have the Lord's word. And the word, the Lord's words, has given us victory in these late, in these recent years, where we've believed in the word and we've obeyed the word, and the word has carried out his the work. This is our victory. God has put before us an open door that no one can close. This is why the scepter of his strength comes from Zion. Verse 3 says, Your people will offer themselves willingly in the day of your warfare, in the splendor of their consecration. And your, your young men will be to you like the dew from the womb of the dawn. In the verse, this same verse in King James, uh, 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 updated version in Portuguese, it reads this way. And Jehovah will send forth the scepter, the strength from Zion, and rule in the midst of his enemies, and your people will offer themselves willingly in the day of your warfare and the splendor of their consecration. Your people will present themselves willingly, willingly, in the day of your warfare. In 2022, God is calling his people, and we've heard his calling. And it says, your young men will be to you like the dew of the womb of the dawn. God promised an army of holy young ones. When we talk about the dew of the heaven, this is uh, the blessing from heaven. No one can produce uh, dew from heaven. This is from God. God provided do from God. It can only come from God. It's his blessing. In this final crucial moment, when all of our young people would be distracted in, in, in the world, uh, apathetic to the things of God, like the young ones in the world, this should also distract our our young ones, but the Lord is doing a miracle in Zion. The young ones are coming like the dew from heaven. Even our young, our children. We saw, uh, we saw our young ones, even our children are being uh, courageous. No one can stop them. They're going out to preach the gospel, our young ones. Being the, the, this army, uh, courageous, this is God's present to the Son. This is not our ability to convince young ones. This is a great miracle from God because God is giving this to his church for the Son. Because the governor man under Satan wants to free himself from all the bonds of God. God chose Christ. God chose Christ. Let's go back to Ephesians 6. In the spiritual uh, power, in the spiritual warfare... Ephesians 6, 10, 
We need to be empowered in the Lord and the strength, power of his strength. It is not by our strength. It doesn't depend on our power. Zechariah 4 says it's not by strength, not by power. But it's by my spirit. This is, says the Lord God of hosts. We don't depend on our strength or our power. Where does our power come from? Our power and strength is in the Word. Romans 10, 17 says that faith comes from hearing and hearing from the Word of Christ. Why do we, where do we get strength for this spiritual battle? Faith in the Word. This is why we have obtained victory after victory because we have faith in the Word. Faith gives us victory. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 19. And what is the surpassing greatness of His power towards us who believe? According to the operation of of the might of his strength. Brothers, with what kind of power will you fight? We need to fight with the surpassing greatness of his power. But where is that surpassing greatness of power which is available to us? It's in the word when we believe. God has not taken his word from us. He's sending week after week the words that come from his, his mouth. We need to not be complicated, but be obedient and practice. Then the victory will come. If we're going to fight this battle, we need to use... His surpassing greatness of His power. What power is this? It's the same power. The same power that operated in Christ. That raised Him from the dead. And sitting Him at the right hand in the heavenlies. The same power. It's with that power that we will overcome. That power is in the Word. And how do we activate that power in the Word? Through faith. We believe. In, in the spiritual world, man has no way to fight with his own strength. We need to call on the surpassing greatness of his power, which is in the Word. We go back to Ephesians 6 and verse 11. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the stratagems of the devil. In this message, we will not be able to get into the armor of God but when this verse talks about the armor of God, it shows us it shows us that we cannot fight with our human instruments. And you can be assured that we're in a spiritual battle with someone much stronger than we are, humanly speaking. Someone who can deceive you. And you might believe that he's happy with what's going on. You think this one is happy? How many people did you preach the gospel to? How many people did you pray for? How many received the seed of the gospel of the kingdom in their hands? 
we're conquering not only the 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 earth we're conquering the heart of people how many people who were under the kingdom of darkness and now they're in the kingdom of light you think that God's enemy is happy with that he has hate for the church. You think he's not going to raise up things against us? Here it talks about the stratagems of, of, of Satan. What are those stratagems? But we are not afraid. We believe in the prophetic word. The prophetic word is a torch that shine in a night and gives us direction. In this we'll be safe. We won't fall into Satan's traps. We won't leave the flow of the river of, of grace. Because if we do, we'll be prey of Satan. In the book of Ephesians, Paul reveals that the church is the body of Christ. The church is defined as through various items. Verse 1, chapter 1. At the end it says, the church is his body, the fullness of the one who fills all in all. In chapter 2, verse 10, it says, The church is the poema, the masterpiece, is created in Christ. It is not a part of the old creation, but the new creation. It's the masterpiece of God. Chapter 2, verse 19, the church is the family of God. It's a building that God is building, that he wants to build as a sanctuary, a sanctuary of God, a dwelling place of God and spirit. Verse 21, 22. In chapter five, it shows that the church is the bride of Christ. And when he comes to chapter six, this church, that was the body of Christ, the church. That is the fullness of Christ, the same church. That is the masterpiece of God, the family of God, the dwelling place of God, the bride of Christ. This same church must put on the armor of God. We must be ready for a spiritual battle. And here in the end of Ephesians, it shows that the church is a warrior, a warrior. This is why we need many of uh, the uh, one who are the valiant uh, soldiers of David. We need to take care of those who are Younger ones, the younger one, and also to care for the older ones. We need these younger ones to fight this battle as God's warriors, the Lord's warrior. But who's our enemy? We need to see. This is the objective of this message. So the armor of God shows that there is a battle between between kingdoms, and that we're the warrior to defeat God's enemy. Remember in Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, he says, I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against the church. That is, the building of the church is to defeat the gates of Hades.
This is why we, through the river of grace, we're taking care of all the aspects of the building of the church. Then he touches, in the end, the matter of the spiritual battle. That means we don't need to wait for the church to be fully built, to be fully be prepared to fight. The building of the church is already a battle. We're already in the battle. But this means we need to, uh, to close off all gaps in, in, our, in, our, in our human life, in our family life, in our children. We need to produce a new culture, preaching the gospel amongst our adolescents, our young ones. This is to close off all gaps to Satan. So, brothers and sisters, thank the Lord. The mystery of the, uh, the will of God in Ephesians, in Ephesians 1, verse 9, it says, making known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure. Which he purposed in himself. This is his will that gives give pleasure to God. And what is it? Is to head up all things in Christ. In the fullness of the time. When the time is ending, we're almost at the end. Uh, we're almost at the end of our time because the millennium still needs to come. In the fullness of time, all things will be headed up in Christ. When Christ heads up all things, the kingdom of Satan will have been totally defeated. This is why we need to go and preach the gospel. All things refer to things in heaven and things on earth. When we go to preach the gospel, we're bringing the government of Christ in the life of people. We need to terminate the dominion of Satan in the life of the person. This is why we need so many young ones to go to the GPC. More, many young ones are lost in this world. God's enemy are destroying the, the life of our young people. Families are being uh, destroyed. People don't see future. We need to give a proper future to our young ones. We need to perfect them in the GPC. We need to make them co-porter. They can become our, our army on the streets to rescue more people. See, so if you open your eyes, you'll see that in your neighborhoods, there are many of these young ones. We're going to bring them. Oh, Lord Jesus. And not only this, In Hebrews 1, uh, chapter 1, verse 13. But to which of the angels has he ever said, Sit at my right hand until I set your enemies as a footstool for your feet? Lucifer expected that God would invite him to sit at his right hand. But he didn't give that to any of the angels. He gave that to his son, Jesus Christ, man. Lord Jesus. Verse 5 in chapter 2. For it was not to angels that he has objected 
the coming inhabited earth concerning which we speak. The coming world is talking about the millennium. God subjected this to man. And what is man that you would remember him? And the son of man that you would care for him? You have made him a little inferior to the angels. In creation, we were created inferior to man, but he crowned him with glory and honor and have set him over the works of your hand. God gave a higher position above angels. The end of verse 8, it says, For in subjecting all things to him, he left nothing unsubject to him. But now we do not yet see all things subjected to him. But we see Jesus, who was made a little inferior to the angels because of the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, so that by grace of God he might take death on behalf of everyone. For it was fitting for him, for whom all things, and through all whom all things, in leading many sons to glory, to make the author of their salvation perfected through suffering, that he might sanctify those who are being sanctified of all of one. Hebrews 10, 12. I'm very encouraged. But this one, having offered one sacrifice for sin, sat down forever on the right hand of God, henceforth waiting until his enemies are made the footstep, footstool for his feet. Amen. Uh, Hebrews 1, 8, 1. Now, in the things which we are being said, the chief point is this. We have such a high priest who sat down at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. He's already been set on the throne. He's above all principalities and powers. Now we, the overcomers in the church, we need to also govern over all the nations. will be taken before the great tribulation and raptured to the heavens. Today, if we fight for the kingdom, he will also rapture us before the great tribulation. Verse 5, And she brought forth a son, a man-child, who is to shepherd all the nations with an iron rod, and her child was caught up to God and to his throne. When we finish our battle hill, we'll be received in the third heavens. But how did they overcome? How were they overcomers? Verse 11. They overcame him. By, because of the blood of the Lamb, not based on your own righteousness. We're here for the blood of the Lamb. <clears throat> and the second, because of the word of their testimony. It's not an empty word. It's a word that has become your reality, your testimony. The flow of grace, we were filled with reality. We overcame by the word of testimony that we give. And they did not love their soul life unto death. This means what? This is what Paul spoke of in uh, Acts 20. What did he say there? And, and nothing I consider my life to be precious for myself. 
Verse 24. Acts 20, 24. I base my life on this verse. But I consider my life of no account as if precious to myself. Brothers and sisters, I don't have more, no more interest in, in power, money, glory. These things I don't consider for my, precious for myself. In order that I finish my course and the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to solemnly testify of the gospel of the grace of God. You know what this attitude is? This is an attitude of someone who gives 110% of himself. He wants a whole team to be this way. We want to be the candidate of the team of God's dream. In, in the United States, they talk about the dream team. We're the team of God's dream. We don't consider our life precious to ourselves. Everything we do, we give 110% for the Lord. You want to be a part of that team? We want to close this age. Oh, Lord Jesus. And the overcomers in Revelation 19. Seven to nine. So the overcomer will be raptured to the third heavens. And will come back with Christ in his parousia. And bef before the, the great tribulation will be a part of his the, the marriage feast of the Lamb, we will be the bride. And then we'll be in a thousand years of the kingdom. She says, let us rejoice and exalt. Let us give glory to God for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his wife has made herself ready and has given her that she should be clothed in fine linen, bright and clean, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. Her, her, she was fully cleansed by the, the blood and the working of grace. And he says to me, Right, blessed are those who are called to the marriage dinner of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are the true words of God. So this is the marriage. And after, after this marriage in the heavens, we will be joined to the great, our great general. Verse 11. And we saw the heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And he, was sitting, he who sits on it, called Faithful and True, and his right, in righteousness he judges and makes war. And his eyes are like the flame of fire and on his head are many diadems and his name was written which no one knows except he himself he has clothed the garment dipped in blood and his name is called the word of God he is the word gives us victory and he is the word of God And the, the armies which were in heaven followed him on white horses dressed in fine linen, white and clean. That, that army is us. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read the rest. This is, these are the ones who will participate in the last battle, the battle of uh, Armageddon. We will defeat Satan and defeat the Antichrist with all of his armies. And Satan will be prisoned for a thousand years and we will reign with Christ in the millennial kingdom for a thousand years. 
This is chapter 20, verse 4. In the verse 4, and they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. Also, verse 6. Blessed and holy is he who has a part in the first resurrection. Over these, the second death has no authority, but they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. Amen. Who wants to be a part of this? That dream team of God is being formed. Let's go back to Ephesians chapter 6. One more verse. Chapter, verse 12. For our wrestling is not against blood and flesh. but against rulers and against authorities, against world rulers of this darkness, against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenlies. Our battle is against that great dragon of, of Revelation 12, which is Satan, and the devil, which is the deceiver of the entire earth. And he with all the angels that followed him. The angels are greater than us in strength and power according to creation. Wanna go to Second Peter chapter two uh, verse eleven. We should not attempt to fight against Satan and his army according to our own strength. Second Peter 2, verse 11. Whereas angels, though are greater in strength and power, do not bring reviling judgment against them before the Lord. I just want to show you here. Your no, your natural strength could not overcome the angels, but by faith we take possession of God's power, and through faith our head is already above all principalities and powers, and by faith Christ raised us up from raised us up in In Hebrews chapter 2, Christ has already raised us up in his resurrection. In verse 6, Ephesians 2, 6. But Ephesians 2, 6. Ephesians 2, 6. And raised us up together with him and seated us together with him in the heavens in Christ Jesus. Man was created inferior to angels, but in the new creation, that when we believed in God, in Christ, now we've been taken to where Christ is. So we're in the heavenlies above all principalities and powers. So now we're above them. So we don't have, we're not afraid of them. The principalities and authorities and the rulers of this earth are the angels who follow Satan and his rebellion. They raised up against, against God. These principalities help Satan to rule over the nations in the heavenly regions. Going back to Ephesians 6. In the verse 12, it says, The evil forces of evil in the heavenlies. 
But which are these? Heavenly. They're not the heavenly regions in Christ. The heavenly regions in Christ are above all the principalities and powers. This heavenly region in Ephesians 2, 2, is it in which you once walked according to the age of this world, according to the rule of authority of the air. This is the region, celestial regions, the heavenlies of the air where the where these authorities are. We are above them. Because of this, brothers, Satan has all of these generals, these helpers, these world rulers over darkness, these evil powers, they rule in the air. We need to really look quickly at Daniel chapter 10. You know where Daniel is? Daniel chapter 10. Daniel saw that he was in a spiritual battle. So he went into prayer to call for help. Verse 12 of chapter 10. Then God sent an angel, an angel to help him. This angel said to him, Don't be afraid, Daniel. For in the first day that you set your heart to understand this matter and to afflict your soul before God. Your words were heard, and I have come because of your words. Our battle, saints, even though we're on earth, our battle is heavenly. They, it occurs in the air. And when we pray, God sends his angels to fight for us. Uh, this angel, when he came to help Daniel, which this angel was probably Gabriel, but when he came, he came up to a great battle. Verse 13, But the prince of the kingdom of Persia, Persia withstood me for 21 days. This shows that that there are angelic beings dominating dominating over over the kingdom of men. In Brazil there's a there's a prince. Over every nation. We don't see, but they're they're dominating people's lives. They they rule over the governments. They rule through the Spewed of power for glory, for money. Our battle is in the air. That's why it's a spiritual battle. The prince who governs Persia uh, resisted Gabriel for 21 days. But Michael... Miguel came to help uh, Gabriel, one of the chief ones, and we came to help me, and I remained there for with the kings of Persia. He gained the victory. Nineteen, and he said, "Don't be afraid, man of preciousness. Peace to you. Be strong. Yes, be strong." And when he spoke to me, I received strength and said, Speak. When the Lord speaks to us, we are strengthened. And he said, Do you know that when I have, why I have come here? 
and that now I will return to fight with the prince of Persia. So I will go forth, and the prince of Javan will also come. However, I will tell you what is inscribed in the writings of truth. Yet there is no one who holds strongly with me except against the ones except Michael, your prince. After the fall, man was disconnected from God's government. He, he fell under the, the em, empire of darkness, of the power of darkness. In Colossians, it's an empire. It's a power that dominates over people. over the different neighborhoods, over, over Rio de Janeiro. Rio must have princes very strong over them, but we have a stronger prince. Colossians 1.13 And he delivered us from the authority of darkness and transferred into the kingdom of the son of his love. <laughs> Brothers, we're going to deliver people from under the authority of darkness. They're sad. They're, they're, they're being punished. They're they're exhausted. We're going to deliver them from the tyranny. This is really tyranny. We're going to bring them into the kingdom of the Son of His love. Okay, saints, to end. What is the real intention of Satan? What is his stratagem? I'm going to use Galatians, like in, in the time of Paul. Galatians. Three, one to five. O oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Before two lies, Jesus Christ was openly portrayed crucified. This only I wish to learn from you. Did you receive the Spirit out of the works of law or out of the hearing of faith? Are you f so foolish, having begun by the Spirit? Are you being perfected by the flesh? Have you suffered so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? He therefore who is bountifully supplies you the spirit does he work does he uh, the words of power are amongst you does he do it out of the works of law or the hearing of faith paul spoke the power, the prophetic words but then the judaizers came to dis to distract people from the pure word that came from the throne of god so they, they told them, besides believing in Christ, you need to practice circumcision, the law of Moses. This is a lie. This is a heresy. This is to distract man from the prophetic word. Distract the church from the prophetic word. The principal strategy of Satan is that one. Verse 14. In order that the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles in, in Christ Jesus. That he might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. What Satan doesn't want is that we would receive and live by the Spirit by faith. When we learn to live by faith, 
will have a way to defeat Satan. Galatians 4, verse 16. So, that I, so then, have I become your enemy by presenting the truth to you? If because I've spoken to you God's word, the prophetic word, have I become your enemies? They are sellers of you, but not rightly, but they desire to shut you out that you may that they you may be zealous of them. In King James uh, updated version in Portuguese, that one Those who are trying to please you, they don't seek you with good intention. The evil strategy of Satan is to isolate the apostle by through using very many distractions. If Satan is able to isolate us from the prophetic word, all of God's work would stop. We won't fall under his deception, under his strategy. Because it's the word that does the work of God. Another Tactic of Satan in First Timothy chapter one. Even as I exhorted you that when you going to Macedonia to remain in Ephesus, to order that in order that you might charge some to teach, to not teach different things. What does it mean to teach different things? There's a prophetic word that God speaks today. But God's enemy wants to distract God's people to, to confuse us in terms of what is God's word. He offers many uh, beautiful messages. Even though a message is beautiful and biblical, you need to look at what is Satan's intention behind this word. We need to look behind what is Satan's intention. He wants to form a smoke cloud so that we could not see what is God's intention today. The matter is not what is biblical or not biblical, but what God wants to speak today. So then he comes with what? He comes with myths, Judaic myths, genealogies. He used people who want to be teachers. He want to show who, what the Bible is. I'm not speaking in vain here. Not give heed to myth and unending gene gene genealogies which produce questioning rather than God's economy which is in faith. But the end of this charge is love out of a pure heart and out of good conscience and out of faint, unfeigned truth. Here, I'm not trying to defend myself. I'm defending the word of God that wants to do God's work. Verse 6, from this which thing some, having missing, have turned aside to vain teaching. In the past, there were many good teaching 
teachings amongst us, but they were not fruitful. We shouldn't go after good words. We need to see what is the word that produces the work of God and produces fruit. Desiring to be teachers of the law, though they understood neither the things that they say nor concerning what they confidently affirm. First, first uh, strategy of Satan is isolate the apostle, the channel of blessing, the prophet. The second one is to produce a, a, a lot of words to form a smoke screen so you could not in identify what God is speaking and what God wants to speak today. These things are there to satisfy those who have curiosity, who have itching ears. They want to see new things, but they don't produce God's economy and faith. Second Corinthians uh, 11, verse 3. But I fear that lest somehow, as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, your thoughts might be corrupted from the simplicity and the purity towards Christ. Our heart, in terms of Christ, should have no doubt, should have no questioning. We need to identify that Christ is speaking and we're going to give our pure heart to God to be simple. Those who are hearing the word with simplicity and obedience are gaining blessing. And the work of God is being carried out through them. We're not going to allow that Satan corrupts our thinking with questions, with doubts. For, for God, we have no doubts. For the words of Christ, we have no doubts. We're pure. We're simple. We're obedient. Then the blessing will come. In 2 Corinthians 10, in verse 3, verse 3, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. Our battle is not according to the flesh. The weapons of our warfare are not fleshly, but powerful before God in overthrowing strongholds and overthrowing reasonings. Brothers, we don't fight with the, the human weapons, the fleshly weapons. In the last elections in Brazil, I had to make, uh, uh, I had to communicate to the church that the church should not lose its focus. Our, our, that is not our battle. Our fight is not with the earthly weapons. The preaching of the gospel is our battle. Many were beginning to doubt. But Peter, shouldn't you teach the, the church of who they should vote for? I said, no, because that is not our battle. Our battle is not against flesh and blood. Unfortunately, the leadership of many Christian groups understood it, it, uh, the, the battle of the church and the earth is politics. So the, the evangelicals should change and influence education and politics. That is not our battle. Our battle is for the word, to allow the spirit to do his work. 
He is doing his work for the preaching of the gospel, gaining person by person, uh, conquering the people and the and God in their life, and we're overcoming and conquering the earth. How many uh, square kilometers are we? Are we overcoming in Africa, in Puerto Rico, in Australia? Oh, Lord Jesus. We've been in Colombia, Ecuador, Bolivia, Peru. Many churches were recovered and restored. We're advancing. We're gaining ground. That is what is causing concern to the gates of Satan. We're not going to turn back. We're going to pre preach the gospel of the kingdom, the word of God. Because the, uh, uh, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. But they overcome reasoning. Is, is what is, what is seems to be truth, but not truth. But every high thing that's raised up against the knowledge of God. The struggle of who knows more. We're not in that struggle. We need to take captive every thought unto the obedience of Christ. Faith is to take us to the obedience of Christ. Who believes, obeys. Being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. When the church is submissive, we're going to make Christ head up all things. Amen? Do you understand what is our battle, our struggle? Let's not get into the wrong battle with the wrong weapons. Our battle is to preach the gospel of the kingdom, to bring, deliver people from the authority of darkness and bring them to light, introduce them into the church, take care of them. And then we're going to take them to be perfected in a GPC, introduce them into a new culture. We're going to, they'll be part of this army with us. We're going to Make this an army that's fighting for God's dream team. We're going to give 110% to God. We're going to give everything to God. Jesus is Lord. 